Throughout the industrialized world, great strides have been made in promoting knowledge about bloodborne pathogens. Training programs, such as this one, have been designed to educate people and to make them aware of the protective measures that should be used to avoid exposure to bloodborne pathogens. This updated program will provide information about bloodborne pathogens and diseases relating to bloodborne pathogens. We will discuss and demonstrate proper methods of infection control and exposure control that will help you to avoid the risk of contamination with potentially infectious materials. There are governmental regulations and standards relating to bloodborne pathogens. The purpose of these standards is to eliminate or to minimize an employee's risk of an occupational exposure to hepatitis B virus, also referred to as HBV, human immunodeficiency virus, also referred to as HIV, and to other potentially infectious bloodborne pathogens. These standards do not automatically apply to employees if they are trained in first aid. However, they do apply to employees who are required by their employer to administer first aid. People who perform unanticipated Good Samaritan acts are not covered, but certainly it is an advantage to anyone to be aware of the precautionary measures that should be taken to avoid an exposure. Before we go further, let's define what is meant by an occupational exposure. A reasonably anticipated skin, eye, mucous membrane, or skin puncture. Contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials that may result from the performance of an employee's duties. Bloodborne diseases. Although the information is directed at occupational hazards in the workplace, the information in this program can be used by anyone, regardless of their job. Let's now examine bloodborne diseases and what are bloodborne pathogens. Actually, they are bacteria, viruses, and other microorganisms carried in the bloodstream. These microorganisms may cause disease, and some pathogens can be deadly. Some of these pathogens that are of greatest risk include hepatitis B virus, or HBV, hepatitis C virus, or HCV, and human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. Hepatitis B, or HBV, attacks the liver and is the major infectious bloodborne occupational hazard to healthcare workers. HBV is considered to be extremely infectious. The exposure to extremely small amounts of HBV positive blood may transmit infection. Fortunately, there are vaccines available to prevent the development of HBV infection. The human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, attacks the body's immune system, weakening it so that it cannot fight and destroy other deadly diseases. HIV causes acquired immune deficiency syndrome, or AIDS. AIDS is a fatal disease, and while treatment for it is improving, there is no known cure. Some of the other less common bloodborne diseases include hepatitis D, malaria, syphilis, viral hemorrhagic fever, and Ebola. Modes of transmission. Let's now take a quick look at how these potentially deadly viruses can pass from one person to another. The HIV and HBV bloodborne pathogens may be transmitted from the infected individual to other individuals by blood or other potentially infectious materials or OPIM such as fluids including semen, vaginal secretions, fluids around the brain and spinal cord, around the joints, abdomen, uterus, heart, saliva from dental procedures, or saliva containing blood, breast milk, and any body fluid visibly contaminated with blood. In situations where it is difficult or impossible to differentiate between body fluids, it must be assumed to be infectious. Hepatitis C is a blood-borne infection caused by an RNA virus, hepatitis C virus, HCV. Hepatitis C is a virus that is passed similarly to hepatitis B. It's passed through blood contact, rarely through sexual uh, contact, although it can be. And um, people that share needles and people who have had blood transfusions before the early 1990s are at great risk for actually having hepatitis C. And it affects the liver by causing usually, usually 
inflammation of the liver with chronic scarring of the liver. And people who, who have hepatitis C are at risk for developing cirrhosis after many, many years, usually 20 years after exposure. This virus causes damage to the liver that may result in chronic infection and disease. HCV is unrelated to any of the other known hepatitis viruses, A, B, D, and E, and infection is identified by the detection of antibodies to the virus in the blood. Unlike many other infections, the presence of antibodies in the blood does not signify recovery. Over 85% of infected individuals fail to clear the virus spontaneously and develop chronic infections. Viruses can't be seen by the eye or even under a microscope. It takes an electron microscope to see them. Worldwide, some 170 million people are chronically infected with HCV, with almost 4 million of them in the United States. There are an estimated 3.9 million Americans affected with hepatitis C, of whom 2.7 million have chronic hepatitis C, 75% of which have no idea they're infected and capable of transmitting the disease to others. About 85% of infected adults will develop chronic or long-lasting hepatitis C infections. To put these numbers in perspective, that's more than three times those infected with HIV or the virus that causes AIDS. HIV is spread when blood or body fluids from an infected person enter the body of a person who is not infected. The Institute of Medicine classifies hepatitis C as an emerging infectious disease. Hepatitis C is serious for some persons, but not for others. Most persons who get hepatitis C carry the virus for the rest of their lives. Most of these persons have some liver damage, but many do not feel sick from the disease. Some persons with liver damage due to hepatitis C may develop cirrhosis or scarring of the liver and liver failure, which may take many years to develop. Bloodborne pathogens can be transmitted by any detached body tissue or organ from a human, living or dead. It's extremely important for you to understand how exposure and transmission can most likely occur in your particular work or life setting. HBV and HIV are most commonly transmitted through sexual contact, sharing of hypodermic needles, from mothers to their children at or before birth, accidental puncture wounds, contact between broken or damaged skin and infected body fluids and contact between mucous membranes and infected body fluids. Lifestyles. You may be at risk if you have had more than one sexual partner. You have unprotected sex. You or your partner have ever been diagnosed with another sexually transmitted disease, such as herpes, gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, or genital warts. You or your partner have had unprotected sexual contact with an infected person. You or your sexual partner are an intravenous drug user. Workplace risks. Certainly, your employer must determine which jobs are at risk. The employer must advise those employees to the exposure risks and the measures to take to reduce such exposure. Occupational risks include professionals in the healthcare industry, First responders, such as fire, police, emergency medical technicians who give first aid, medical attention, or through other exposures. An occupational risk includes coming into contact with blood or body fluids at work. This could include morticians, custodial workers, and human service care providers. First aid providers. A common barrier to action in an emergency is fear of disease transmission between an ill or injured person and a first aid provider. As an example, the perceived risk of disease transmission during CPR has reduced the willingness of some laypersons to initiate mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation in unknown victims of cardiac arrest. Because of disease transmission concerns, First aid providers must learn the importance of standard precautions or body substance isolation. They must know what steps to take for personal protection from bloodborne pathogens. These steps include how to use, remove, and discard such equipment. First aid providers are obviously at an increased exposure risk, and they should have the responsibility of meeting more comprehensive bloodborne pathogen standards. Vaccines. 
There are no vaccines or cures for HCV or HIV. However, there is a vaccine for HBV. Vaccination is your best protection against HBV. The vaccine is given in a series of three doses. Most often, these three doses are taken over a six-month time period. The vaccine works most effectively when all three doses are taken. If you decide to get the HBV vaccination, you should check with your doctor and or your employer. The vaccine is safe and effective and is currently recommended for children as well as adults. Standard precautions. Standard precautions is a method of infection control in which all human blood and certain human body fluids are treated as if they are known to be infectious for HIV, HBV, HCV, and other bloodborne pathogens. Standard precautions are to be observed in all situations where there is a potential for contact with blood or other potentially infectious material. Some body fluids may be difficult to differentiate between other types of body fluid. In this case, all body fluids are to be considered potentially infectious. A good rule of thumb to follow is always place a barrier between you and any moist or wet substance originating from another person. Hepatitis B or HBV is extremely infectious and is more prevalent than the more publicized HIV or hepatitis C or HCV. By utilizing standard precautions, you can help protect yourself not only from HBV, but all other bloodborne pathogens. Personal protection. We've already discussed the things you can do in your lifestyle outside of work, and these behaviors can be an important part of your protection from bloodborne pathogens. In the workplace, it's important to be familiar with appropriate personal protection. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, is considered appropriate. If it does not permit blood or other potentially infectious substances and contaminated materials to pass through or reach your work clothing, street clothing, undergarments, skin, eyes, mouth, or other mucous membranes under normal conditions of use, and for the duration of time the protective equipment is in use. Here are some basic rules to follow. Wash your hands immediately or as soon as possible after removal of gloves or other personal protective equipment. Always wear personal protective equipment in exposure situations. Remove PPE before leaving the work area. Keep your work area clean and sanitized. Decontaminate area routinely. Handle and dispose of any sharp items that may be contaminated with extreme caution by using mechanical means such as tongs, brush, and dustpan or forceps. Never use bare or gloved hands. Some of the examples of PPE are gloves should be disposable, single-use gloves made of latex or other fluid impervious materials. All cuts or sores on your hands should be covered with a bandage as additional protection before applying your gloves. Goggles or protective eyewear must be worn whenever there is a risk of splashing or vaporizing of contaminated fluids. Bloodborne pathogens can be transmitted through the thin membranes of the eyes, so it is extremely important to protect them. Face shields can be worn in addition to goggles or other protective eyewear to protect the nose and mouth. Aprons or jumpsuits prevent contaminated infectious material from reaching clothing and undergarments as well as exposed skin surfaces. The material should be appropriate for the level of exposure. CPR mask or other mouth to barrier device is strongly recommended. Caps and booties cover the head and shoes completely. Be sure the booties are tied securely. Any PPE or normal clothing items that become soiled with infectious material must be removed as soon as possible. Contaminated materials must be handled with caution and placed in an appropriately labeled bag or container until it is decontaminated or properly disposed. Along with PPE is the advice that you should never drink, smoke, handle contact lenses, 
or apply cosmetics or lip balm until you have left the area containing potentially infectious materials. Do not leave the area until you have thoroughly washed your hands. Containers, color coding, and labels. For decontamination and disposal methods, your employer will provide specifically labeled and color coded containers, such as biohazard bags, sharp containers, biohazard laundry bags. Regulated waste containers are required to be color coded or labeled with the biohazard sign. These color codes and labels are intended to warn the person who handles the container. Biohazard symbols and labels must be fluorescent orange or orange red with letters or symbols in a contrasting color. These symbols must be affixed to any container that is used to store or transport potentially infectious materials. Exposure. One of the most common definitions of an occupational exposure is a specific eye, mouth, other mucous membrane, non-intact skin, or piercing mucous membranes or the skin barrier through such events as needle sticks, human bites, cuts and abrasions, contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials that result from the performance of an employee's duties. In case of an exposure, remember these key words, stop, wash, and report. Stop whatever you are doing as soon as possible and wash the exposed area immediately with soap and running water. Cleanse thoroughly by scrubbing vigorously and creating a good lather. Rinse mucous membranes, which is considered the eyes and mouth, with plenty of water. Try to save any contaminated object for testing purposes. Report the incident to your employer as promptly as possible. Seek medical help, treatment, and counseling. If you have not already been vaccinated against HBV, this treatment can be administered even after you have been exposed. Exposure Control Each organization must have an exposure control plan. All new employees must be informed and trained in these policies and procedures. Workplace exposure control plans are implemented to eliminate or minimize the employee's exposure to bloodborne pathogens. When cleaning a spill, you must remember to use standard precautions. Protect yourself and others from exposures. When cleaning, wear appropriate protective gloves and use an appropriate and approved solution. An inexpensive approved solution is 10% bleach in water or one-fourth cup of bleach to one gallon of water, which is freshly made. You should use disposable towels and, if necessary, a disposable brush and tray to clean the spill. Everything must be placed in a biohazard bag and disposed of according to the workplace exposure control plan. During work, you may come into contact with IV needles, hypodermic needles, razors and other blades, scalpels, scissors, broken glass, and other sharp objects. Use extreme caution when handling, storing, or using sharp objects. Needles should be disposed of by carefully placing them into an appropriate, labeled, puncture-proof container designed for sharps. Never clean up broken sharp materials with your hands. Use a dustpan and brush or tongs. These materials must go into sharps containers and not placed in biohazard bags. Contaminated laundry must be placed into leak-resistant labeled containers. If plastic biohazard bags are being used, they should be doubled as an extra precaution. Remember to wear the proper personal protection whenever handling soiled, contaminated laundry. We certainly haven't covered all aspects of bloodborne pathogens, but speak with your employer and contact your local public health unit for more information on bloodborne pathogens. You can protect yourself and reduce your risk of exposure to a bloodborne pathogen by the use of PPE and practicing standard precautions, both at home and at work. Lifestyle behavior modification will also minimize the risk of exposure. Thank you.
Ocean inspectors have been given new directions from Washington for enforcing the standard covering occupational exposure to bloodborne diseases. Inspectors are now placing more emphasis on number one, the use of commercially available, safer medical devices to reduce needle sticks. Number two, engineering controls, including safer needles and work practices to reduce exposures. Number three, interactive training and education whenever safer medical devices are implemented. OSHA states that this new direction does not mean the bloodborne pathogen standard has changed, but employers are expected to use readily available technology. The federal government has recently passed the Healthcare Worker Needle Stick Prevention Act, H.R. 1899. The Healthcare Worker Needle Stick Prevention Act of 1999 prevents dangerous, costly, and preventable needle stick injuries to our nation's healthcare workers. This bill is designed to correct a dangerous problem in today's healthcare system in which healthcare workers suffer preventable needle stick injuries because appropriate technologies to prevent such injuries are not being utilized. The bill would require the use of engineered safety mechanisms for needles and sharps in the healthcare area to protect healthcare workers from life threatening injuries caused by needle stick and other sharps injuries. Exposure control plan. Employers would develop written exposure control plans to identify and select existing needleless systems and sharps with engineered sharps protections and other methods of preventing the spread of bloodborne pathogens. Sharps injury log. While we know that more than 800,000 healthcare workers suffer needle stick every year, there is currently no uniform collection of data on sharps injuries to enable these incidents to be tracked, learned from, and prevented. The bill would create a Sharps injury log that employers would keep containing detailed information about any Sharps injuries that occur. Employers would be required to adequately train direct care health care workers on the use of needleless technologies and systems with engineered Sharps protections. National Clearinghouse on Safer Needle Technology. The bill would establish a new clearinghouse within the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, to collect data on engineered safety technology designed to help prevent the risk of needle stick and other sharps injuries. To make a long story short, employers must do more to use advanced needle technology and greater sharps engineering controls. Thank you. The Bloodborne Pathogen Standard has many requirements and responsibilities that must be provided, such as a comprehensive exposure control program, needle stick injury prevention, personal protective equipment, medical records, record keeping, and much more. What we would like to do in this particular program is list the 14 elements of information and training that is required for your Bloodborne Pathogen program to meet OSHA standards. You might say this would be a great checklist to ensure that your program is up to date and is in compliance. Required information and training. This information is taken directly from OSHA standards relating to bloodborne pathogens, 1910.1030 G2. The first part of required information and training is employers shall ensure that all employees with occupational exposure participate in a training program, which must be provided at no cost to the employee and during working hours. If your job reasonably anticipates you being exposed to blood or other potentially infectious materials, or OPIM, this training would apply to you.
at the time of initial assignment to tasks where occupational exposures may take place. This means when you are first assigned these tasks, training must be provided. Training must be provided at least annually thereafter. Annual training for all employees shall be provided within one year of their previous training. Employers shall provide additional training when changes such as modification of tasks or procedures or institution of new tasks or procedures affect the employee's occupational exposure. The additional training may be limited to addressing the new exposures created. Material appropriate in content and vocabulary to educational level, literacy, and language of employees shall be used. Basically, this standard means the company must train at the educational level and literacy competence of the individuals and the language used by the employees. If Vietnamese is the language spoken by employees, then training must be in that language. 14 Required Elements The training program shall contain, at a minimum, the following elements. Element 1. An accessible copy of the regulatory text of this standard and an explanation of its contents. Element 2. A general explanation of the epidemiology and symptoms of bloodborne diseases. Epidemiology is the study of factors affecting the health and illness of populations and symptoms of infection of bloodborne diseases. Element 3. An explanation of the modes of transmission of bloodborne pathogens, generally, how bloodborne pathogens are transmitted through exposure to these pathogens. Element 4. An explanation of the employer's exposure control plan and the means by which the employee can obtain a copy of the written plan. This is the employer's exposure control plan and where the employee can obtain a copy of the plan. Element 5. An explanation of the appropriate methods for recognizing tasks and other activities that may involve exposure to blood and other potentially infectious materials. Element 6. An explanation of the use and limitations of methods that will prevent or reduce exposure, including appropriate engineering controls, work practices, and personal protective equipment. Element 7. Information on the types, proper use, location, removal, handling, decontamination, and disposal of personal protective equipment. Element 8. An explanation of the basis for selection of personal protective equipment. This training explains why particular personal protective equipment is used and the purpose of wearing it. Element 9. Information on the hepatitis B vaccine, including information on its efficacy, safety, method of administration, the benefits of being vaccinated, and that the vaccine and vaccination will be offered free of charge. This type of training would cover these aspects of the hepatitis B vaccine and information for you to make a decision to take the vaccine or decline it. Element 10. Information on the appropriate actions to take and persons to contact in an emergency involving blood or other potentially infectious materials. This information helps you take proper action in the event you are exposed to blood or OPIM. Element 11. An explanation of the procedure to follow if an exposure incident occurs, including the method of reporting the incident and the medical follow-up that will be made available. Element 12. Information on the post-exposure evaluation and follow-up that the employer is required to provide for the employee following an exposure incident. Element 13. An explanation of the signs and labels and or color coding required by paragraph G1. And Element 14. An opportunity for interactive questions and answers with the person conducting the training session. If the training is conducted online, there should be an opportunity for you to ask questions to a topic expert, generally via telephone or email. Other Requirements The person conducting the training shall be knowledgeable in the subject matter covered by the elements contained in the training program as it relates to the workplace that the training will address. The Bloodborne Pathogen Standard is very comprehensive and requires compliance in all parts of the standard. Employees who may reasonably anticipate being exposed, such as first aid providers, emergency responders, hospital workers, and similarly employed persons, must be trained. Of course, all training must be properly documented. Documentation is a mandatory requirement on almost any training that is conducted in any organization. <laughs>